This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kim Zuckert, Tales of the Brass Hedgehog, Hedgehog.net. A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 5 I Elude My Watchdog. Sola stared into the brute's wicked-looking eyes, muttered a word or two of command, pointed to me, and left the chamber. I could not but wonder what this ferocious-looking monstrosity might do when left alone in such close proximity to such a relatively tender morsel of meat. But my fears were groundless, as the beast, after surveying me intently for a moment, crossed the room to the only exit which led to the street, and lay down full length across the threshold. This was my first experience with a Martian watchdog, but it was destined not to be my last, for this fellow guarded me carefully during the time I remained a captive among these green men, twice saving my life, and never voluntarily being away from me for a moment. While Sola was away, I took occasion to examine more minutely the room in which I found myself captive. The mural painting depicted scenes of rare and wonderful beauty, mountains, rivers, lake, ocean, meadow, trees and flowers, winding roadways, sun-kissed gardens, scenes which might have portrayed earthly views but for the different colorings of the vegetation. The work had evidently been wrought by a master hand, so subtle the atmosphere, so perfect the technique, yet nowhere was there a representation of a living animal, either human or brute, by which I could guess at the likeness of these other and perhaps extinct denizens of Mars. While I was allowing my fancy to run riot in wild conjecture on the possible explanation of the strange anomalies which I had so far met with on Mars, Sola returned, bearing both food and drink. These she placed on the floor beside me, and, seating herself a short ways off, regarded me intently. The food consisted of about a pound of some solid substance of the consistency of cheese, and almost tasteless, while the liquid was apparently milk from some animal. It was not unpleasant to the taste, though slightly acid, and I learned in a short time to prize it very highly. It came, as I later discovered, not from an animal, as there is only one mammal on Mars, and that one very rare indeed, but from a large plant which grows practically without water, but seems to distill its plentiful supply of milk from the products of the soil, the moisture of the air, and the rays of the sun. A single plant of this species will give eight or ten quarts of milk per day. After I had eaten I was greatly invigorated, but feeling the need of rest I stretched out upon the silks and was soon asleep. I must have slept several hours as it was dark when I awoke, and I was very cold. I noticed that someone had thrown a fur over me, but it had become partially dislodged, and in the darkness I could not see to replace it. Suddenly a hand reached out and pulled the fur over me. Shortly afterwards, adding another to my covering. I presumed that my watchful guardian was Sola, nor was I wrong. This girl alone, among all the green Martians with whom I came in contact, disclosed characteristics of sympathy, kindliness, and affection. Her ministrations to my bodily wants were unfailing, and her solicitous care saved me from much suffering and many hardships. As I was to learn, the Martian nights are extremely cold, and as there is practically no twilight or dawn, the changes in temperature are sudden and most uncomfortable, as are the transitions from brilliant daylight to darkness. The nights are either brilliantly illumined or very dark, for if neither of the two moons of Mars happen to be in the sky, almost total darkness results, since the lack of atmosphere, or rather the very thin atmosphere, fails to diffuse the starlight to any great extent. On the other hand, if both of the moons are in the heavens at night, the surface of the ground is brightly illuminated. Both of Mars' moons are vastly nearer her than is our moon to Earth, the nearer moon being but about five thousand miles distant, while the further is but little more than fourteen thousand miles away, against the nearly one-quarter million miles which separate us from our moon. The nearer moon of Mars makes a complete revolution round the planet, in a little over seven and one-half hours, so that she may be seen hurtling through the sky like some huge meteor two or three times each night, revealing all her phases during each transit of the heavens. The further moon revolves about Mars in something over thirty and one-quarter hours, 
and with her sister Satellite, makes the nocturnal Martian scene one of splendid and weird grandeur. And it is well that nature has so graciously and abundantly lighted the Martian night, for the green men of Mars, being a nomadic race, without high intellectual development, have but crude means for artificial lighting, depending principally upon torches, a kind of candle, and a peculiar oil lamp which generates a gas and burns without a wick. This last device produces an intensely brilliant, far-reaching white light, but as the natural oil which it requires can only be obtained by mining in one of several widely separated and remote localities, it is seldom used by these creatures, whose only thought is for today, and whose hatred for manual labor has kept them in a semi-barbaric state for countless ages. After Solar replenished my coverings, I again slept, nor did I awaken until daylight. The other occupants of the room, five in number, were all females, and they were still sleeping, piled high with a motley array of silks and furs. Across the threshold lay stretched the sleepless guardian brute, just as I had last seen him on the preceding day. Apparently he had not moved a muscle. His eyes were fairly glued upon me, and I fell to wondering just what might befall me should I endeavor to escape. I have ever been prone to seek adventure and to investigate an experiment where wiser men would have left well enough alone. It therefore now occurred to me that the surest way of learning the exact attitude of this beast toward me would be to attempt to leave the room. I felt fairly secure in my belief that I could escape him should he pursue me once I was outside the building, for I had begun to take great pride in my ability as a jumper. Furthermore, I could see from the shortness of his legs that the brute himself was no jumper, and probably no runner. Slowly and carefully, therefore, I gained my feet, only to see that my watcher did the same. Cautiously I advanced toward him, finding that by moving with a shuffling gait I could retain my balance as well as make reasonably rapid progress. As I neared the brute he backed cautiously away from me, and when I had reached the open he moved to one side to let me pass. He then fell in behind me, and followed about ten paces in my rear as I made my way along the deserted street. Evidently his mission was to protect me only, I thought, but when we reached the edge of the city he suddenly sprang before me, uttering strange sounds and bearing his ugly and ferocious tusks. Thinking to have some amusement at his expense, I rushed toward him, and, when almost upon him, sprang into the air, alighting far beyond him and away from the city. He wheeled instantly and charged me with the most appalling speed I had ever beheld. I had thought his short legs a bar to swiftness, but had he been coursing with greyhounds, the latter would have appeared as though asleep on a doormat. As I was to learn, this is the fleetest animal on Mars, and owing to its intelligence, loyalty, and ferocity, is used in hunting, in war, and as the protector of the Martian man. I quickly saw that I would have difficulty in escaping the fangs of the beast on a straightaway course, and so I met his charge by doubling in my tracks and leaping over him as he was almost upon me. This maneuver gave me considerable advantage, and I was able to reach the city quite a bit ahead of him. And as he came tearing after me, I jumped for a window about thirty feet from the ground in the face of one of the buildings overlooking the valley. Grasping the sill, I pulled myself up to a sitting posture without looking into the building, and gazed down at the baffled animal beneath me. My exultation was short-lived, however, for scarcely had I gained a secure seat upon the sill than a huge hand grasped me by the neck from behind and dragged me violently into the room. Here I was thrown upon my back, and beheld standing over me a colossal, ape-like creature, white and hairless, except for an enormous shock of bristly hair upon its head. End of chapter 5